second as that. Just see. Do I actually get this going? I'm not sure whether this will work. But maybe. Okay. Okay. Fine. So I, I'm going to talk. I loosely said I'm going to a whole spectrum of TensorFlow, um, and so. Hopefully we'll cover both of the, the kind of deep tech piece, which will really be an advert for the TensorFlow meetup group, and all the way to AutoML. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm Martin Andrews. Um, I've got a kind of background in machine learning, startups, finance. I moved from New York to Singapore in 2013. 2014, I kind of lived in Singapore under the radar um, doing machine learning, deep learning, NLP for fun, um, and robots and drones. And basically, I essentially converted myself, like a, a good kind of WSG kind of thing, I converted myself from a finance guy to AI guy. Um, and kind of proved that in 2015 when we got, I got Cirrus working for a local company in Singapore, and we've been doing natural language kind of products there. Um, Along the way, I've become this GDE ML, which is great, I guess. Um, free, free labor for Google. Um, so I do the TensorFlow and deep learning meetup here. Uh, I've written a couple of papers as a, like a, a gentleman scientist. And I've been running a developer course with the, my co-organizer for the meetup group. And with him, we have also built a little company. So this is Red Dragon AI. Um, we're a Google partner for doing kind of deep learning consulting prototypes. Uh, we partnered with SG Innovate to do education and training. Um, and we're also very interested in this kind of conversational AI, natural language voices, or natural voices, knowledge bases. So that's, that's about me. So I've done the, the who am I. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about kind of the TensorFlow ecosystem and, and how it's evolved. Um, I can do a little demo for TensorFlow with Keras. Uh, I can talk about AutoML uh, and then wrap up. But just so I know who, who you are now, so I've done the who am I, um, how many people are kind of have done machine learning anything before? OK, so, so how, how many people are at a company where they wish they had done machine learning of some kind? You wish you could be machine learners? No one cares. OK, I might as well go home. OK. Um, how many people then, OK, so either in that case, you must have either come for pizza or dancing. How many people came for the pizza? <laughs> ah, so the rest of you must be, this is a, a kind of a new example from the deep learning field um, for dancing. So this guy, this guy can dance, OK? These people cannot dance. Ah, except if you use the power of deep learning. This is kind of interesting. So, so whereas the, the task for machine learning is to say good dancer, originally bad dancers, um, this is where you, the kind of things that people are now beginning to be able to do with deep learning techniques. Come on, they're going to do ballet soon. OK, bad dancing. <laughs> Better. It's surprising how, how limber the guy on the, the right has got. There we go. OK. So let me, let me go on with, with the TensorFlow stuff now. So um, how many people have seen this picture before? This is from last year. Okay, so very few, um, very few people willing to put up their hands. Okay, so basically, what this is how TensorFlow was kind of originally. This is a diagram which has grown from when TensorFlow was originally launched. Um, on top of the TensorFlow, which is basically a, a means to get models built into something which you can execute. Basically, this can be accessed via C++, Java, or Go, but the, the primary thing is a Python front end. And on top of that, there's various other libraries of layers of different operations. Keras is kind of an important um, way of doing machine learning. 
as a high-level API. And also Google have been pressing on to make estimators to make it so people can use like a psychic learn kind of interface. Um, but also, how can you deploy it? You can deploy it onto the, your CPU, onto your GPU, on Android and iOS devices, and also using this thing called XLA, which can do, is like a compiler for this stuff. So basically, this is, is grown and grown, and, and people have um, kind of thought that they, they would make this diagram last forever. But it kind of, Peter, from what I saw from when I put this together last night, people have given up with this diagram because too much has been happening. So one of the things which has been happening, in particular to this middle layer, this TensorFlow main layer, is there are now more options for that layer. So you've got TensorFlow, which is kind of the original version. We've also got TensorFlow Lite, which can be de deployed on mobile devices or as part of these um, you know, cloud functions or whatever. Um, so this is kind of a stripped down, efficient version, which doesn't have all the bells and whistles. There's also TensorFlow.js, Basically, if you can train a model um, in your you know, big GPU setup and then deploy that into any browser. So this is a model which should execute on people's browser and give them machine learning functionality. You can do real-time video overlays. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff using JavaScript just in their browser. Um, so that's, there are wild times ahead for that because the browser, pe the, the, sorry, the JavaScript people is kind of a different animal from the Python guy, right? So that's kind of exciting. There's also um, a thing called eager mode which is coming along, and the TensorFlow teams are excited about eager mode. Um, and I maybe I should uh, talk a little about why this is interesting. So the way in which TensorFlow works is you kind of describe your model to the to the TensorFlow. And then TensorFlow goes away and crunches it up in some way, so then it executes it. This is very different from if you're just writing a standard program where you tell it the steps you want to do. If you tell it the steps you want to do, you get a, an error as soon as you tell it the wrong thing. Okay? Here, it would take the, your whole recipe for real TensorFlow, it would take your whole recipe, compile it, and then from the compiled code, it would say you made a, an error, and the error messages are diabolical because you don't actually, there's no actual necessary correspondence between what it's giving you an error message about and the actual line of code you told it, because it may be hidden away in the wrapping up. One thing which has come along last year is something called PyTorch, which is another framework for building neural network models. And that works very much like uh, a NumPy, like a standard Python library, but using your GPU. And what has got Google, um, concerned is that a lot of researchers are using PyTorch to build papers with. Partly because it's so much easier to debug. If you make an error, it just tells you straight away. So this is where they've now built eager mode, which is a new mode for TensorFlow, where instead of taking your graph, doing all these operations, and then finally letting you know at the end of the day um, how it's working, it tells you immediately. And so this is something which is suddenly, as, as the talk about eager mode has, has ramped up, and this is essentially PyTorch, not that Google would want me to say it, but it's kind of PyTorch mode for TensorFlow. And it makes TensorFlow kind of very nice to use, um, but it's got this huge ecosystem behind it of all this other nice stuff, which PyTorch was never really designed for. PyTorch was much more of a, a prototype -y kind of thing. Um, so. Another thing that has just come along, which doesn't really fit in the diagram too well, is ingesting data using tf.data. So this is APIs where you tell it where my data is. I, you know, it's a CSV file, it's all these images. You ingest it, so you, you pull it off the disk or whatever, you fill it around, and then you can train models using it. And it, what people would normally do before is you'd have a loop in Python, pulling this stuff little by little into the, the GPU. But the tf.data, that they are arranging it so that it can be all handled within this TensorFlow graph. And the benefit of doing that is you can organize it so that it works in an asynchronous manner, so it's much more efficient. Your CPU being kept busy while the GPU is doing the, the training work. Um, but the bigger benefit, which Google didn't really, um, hasn't been so upfront about, is, is the whole thing with TPUs. Now, TPUs are... Um, extremely fast pieces of silicon that Google has made because NVIDIA licensing, NVIDIA latency, all these other situations, and also NVIDIA chips, 
the GPUs which people have been using have also got a lot of silicon devoted to graphics. For the machine learners, we don't care about the graphics bit. We care about matrix operations. So TPUs, are basically, Google has rolled their own silicon, and they make it into massive arrays of these things. These are pods. So this is a, a pod of TPUs. But it's, a TPU is not a card you can put in a machine. In particular, it's not a card you're going to put in a machine even next to your virtual machine at Google, in the Google Cloud. The Google Cloud uh, virtual machines are in one place. The pods are in another place. So the benefit of having this TF data ingestion going on in the graph is that they can then transmit the graph into the pod and have it executed there. So your actual VM, if you've got a TPU attached, can be a tiny VM, as long as you can transmit what you need to do across the network. Okay. So once you've got this network in the graph, you know, network over there, what about the disk? Where does the data come from? Wouldn't it be better if I just had the data locally? But the, the, the thing which amazed me is even if you have it on an, with a, like a, a normal local machine, you'd have an SSD with all your data on to pump it into your GPU, and it, everything would be happy. The problem with TPUs is that they're so fast, uh, SSD will not keep up with them. So that you'll be starving your TPU for data, even with local SSDs. But the neat thing in a Google data center is that if you store your data in buckets, it, it basically, the data will be streaming into the TPU pod from lots of different directions simultaneously. And the actual network transmission speed of this will overall be higher than SSD, just because you've got multiple parallel routes into your, your pod. And so this is kind of crazy. It's a crazy thing where the, the kind of the old idea of having network accessible storage is a, is a, a, you know, a slow problem. Actually, Google has levered this with their data centers. I, I digress. Okay. Making it easier. OK, here's a key point. So Google has made also making this machine learning thing easier, um, first by these Cloud Vision APIs. Basically, the, these are pre-built models where you can ask, OK, what kind of dog is this? Or what, kind, what of these 100,000 class, classes is this from? Um, or you know, what landmarks are these? But there's also this new product, which is kind of heavily pushed at uh, the Cloud Next, which was this AutoML. Basically, this allows you to build on an automatic, or allows Google to build automatically from your data um, good, good models. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So, so let's go back to the kind of the raw stuff, the, the real deal um, in the cloud. Another thing which Google has come along with is this Google Colab. How many people have heard of this thing? Some people, OK. This is a super thing which people should, everywhere should be using. If you use Jupyter and you want to do machine learning, basically it allows you to use a free GPU from Google. Um, it's a, a preemptible one in that it could be taken away from you at any time. And the machine could die, die at any time. It's, it will definitely die after 12 hours. But you can then just have one, another one back. Okay? But it allows you to train on a GPU. And you can also then save the, the models off to your drive or off to a bucket or wherever. So it is basically, at work, we've been keeping these going continuously for several months. Right? Um, just as you, know, you, you leave a job running overnight, um, come back the next day. It's all on your drive. The machine died, but it doesn't really matter. You can then re revive it, continue training. So you get a free, a free K80 um, from Google. Very nice of them. Um, but the, the reason they've got all these, these K80s lying about is because the TPUs have taken over all the workload that these old GPUs did. So now they've got these for free. They've also built some kind of, this is for dollars now. So Google's built deep learning VM images. So these are all pre-installed with the latest NVIDIA drivers. TensorFlow's compiled to use this even better than normal. Um, they also have the same thing for PyTorch, which is a very interesting move. So um, hats off to them. OK, so now I will do a quick demo of TensorFlow and Keras. But since no one here cares about machine learning, I, I'm not sure why I'm going to do that. But um, one thing, so this is part of a repo which I have. So I've been running this kind of deep learning workshops for quite a while. We've been running these. Um, I have a repo with tons of examples in. Um, but also, now we're just converting over to running these things in Colab. Essentially, last year we ran a, deep, a developer course where half the class had a GPU and half the class had a really tough time. 
Okay. Now, everyone can have a GPU. It may not be a great GPU, um, but just running this directly on Colab from GitHub um, makes for a great experience. So, da -da -da. so this, is, this is my Jupyter. This is a Jupyter network running directly on here because Colab is not trustable in front of 200 people. So. Okay, so what I, what I want, the, the, the kind of the use case here, and this is kind of a common use case that people will have, is they've got a bunch of images that they want to classify. And so this is a classification problem. I would love to be able to show you the everyone can dance, but this is not, that's not for today. So, um, and the way in which people do this typically is instead of building a network from scratch and training it on just your images, they will take a pre-built network and then kind of switch out what it's looking for. So I'll go through this. So, so within a thing called Keras, which is a, a, a higher level API on top of TensorFlow, there is a model zoo. And basically there are a whole bunch of models where if this is the number of parameters, so these, these are really big models, these are small models, and this is the kind of the precision to be expected, then you can kind of have this efficient frontier of, of smaller and better models will be up in this corner. And so all of these are available. These all come from different waves of research um, as time has progressed. So I'm going to take a model called NASNet, which has a particular picture here. So hopefully it's just going to load the model. Load the model. Of course, we may decide not to load. Come on, come on. If it's not going to load, it's a problem. So the issue with a, with an external model zoo is I have to call the model zoo. Come on. Okay, I will pragmatically redo this. I'm not sure I can trust this to work at all. I will have to plug ahead. Let me talk a little bit then about this NASNet thing. So rather, I could show you, this is, this is a, a demo essentially I could, I could show you online. So it, it is available online. So let me just talk a little bit about this NASNet. And the reason this NASNet kind of thing is interesting is because this is the basis on which some of this auto ML stuff is done. So in previously what has happened with, with all these um, architectures is that somebody, or particularly like these big and bad ones, originally somebody built these by hand um, using kind of old technology, and it was a very laborious process. Similarly, that it then went on to inception 
you know, reception one, two, and three, and then there's these resnets, all of this being built by graduate students, essentially. And so this is known as graduate student descent, in that they would build good models, and basically you'd use human labor to build these things. And there's a limit to that, and a limit to the scalability of that. So what Google decided to do was instead of using people to do this, they would make people build models that build models. So this is uh, where this, this is the net, NASNet stands for Network Architecture Search. So basically they made the network architecture search into a game. And so the game is played by coming up with a network architecture, seeing what I can score on ImageNet, then, then coming back and trying again. But because I know what my, essentially I come up with a structure, I come up with a score, I can use that as kind of a plain go. I can use that as a Dota 5 kind of thing. I can learn how to build these network architectures. So what then happens is basically it then builds, basically the game has, is structured to build me a cell from which I can build an image net recognizer. So this is the cell which has been built by a machine learning to build things. And so this is where essentially this, it will now become impossible for humans to compete in this game. In that because the machines do this so efficiently and can be told all sorts of constraints that I want this as small as possible, I want this to fill, fit in you know, this degree of latency, extremely difficult for humans to play that game, but he, computers can do it ultra well. Um, so this, this whole thing has got more and more efficient. Um, these NASNet models, on the other hand, have just been released. So you can download one of these things when the network gets through and just get these NASNet mobile weights directly um, and then use it. So basically, I'll get a single prediction from this thing. I, here's an image. I read the image. I show it. Bah, bah, and then I get a single prediction from this NASNet model. And so here is a, this is an image net prediction demo. It's just worked. So, um, so this is coming back. This is, ImageNet is a standard um, image competition which has recently been abandoned just because machines have surpassed human accuracy and so now we essentially need something more, more difficult to do. Um, so this is, it is basically a thousand categories of things including a clearly tabby, tiger cat, Egyptian cat, Persian cat and lynx. Okay? And this is a picture of tabby cats, it's fairly certain or f fairly sure of that. And basically I've got a, a, a directory full of images here and so here's another one. Um, it thinks this one is Siamese cat, not a bad idea. This one, I'm not, a, I'm not sure what it is. Anyway, standard poodle, maybe. It, ImageNet, the thousand glasses don't cover um, like snowy white owl, okay? So it has no idea what this is. So I mean, sometimes it would say like golf ball or anyway, that it just does not know, right? So it's, but it will be, relatively reasonably certain about the wrong answer okay and then there's this one dingo could be um or maybe that may be a shiba inu anyway so ImageNet also has a very large number of dogs that large number of dog breeds in there for for no apparent reason um but these are also very difficult to for humans to tell apart so part of the way in which ImageNet beats humans is by being good at dogs which is not Anyway, it's not, it's, but it's, it may make horrible errors because it has, the ImageNet has very few humans in there. ImageNet is not, not good at human distinctions at all. It may have person as being a class, right? Um, but it doesn't have, it also has gorilla as a class, and that's been a problem for Google. So, um, so there's a, a question of data and uh, dignity as well. Okay. So basically, here, 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 here is the model which this is loaded. Um, this is a neural network with many, many layers of these things. So this is a, a very, very lo long network, basically designed by computer rather than human. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to take this model and do a trick. So this is the, the if I can have you the, get rid of the header, little one. Okay. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, this is the ImageNet network, and I can take, an, this is my input image, and then I do some kind of black box mystery work with this NASNet. And at the end, I'll get back like probabilities for each of the thousand classes, or not even probabilities, something before probabilities. Okay? 
Now, that I there would then do an operation called a softmax, which would then give me actual kind of probabilities, and the biggest one is my choice. Okay? So the biggest output in this layer is you know, tabby cat, or, or whatever it is. But it will kind of have like, answers for all of the other classes. They'd just be very small answers, hopefully. What I want to do with this, this repurpose network, though, is I'm going to strip off this last answer, because I want to use it on my own classes. I don't want to use the ImageNet classes. It may be that I want to classify, for instance, cars. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take off this last piece and instead use these kind of pre-outputs. Essentially, basically, this is a bunch of... Mis apart from this one, all of the rest of it is kind of degrees of mistake. So I'm basically I'm taking the, the way in which it's made mistakes and trying to use that to classify cars or, or whatever to my, my own thing. I'm going to use a model called an SVM. It's a very standard kind of your boss would understand this model thing. Okay? So the, one of the nice reasons for wanting to do this um, transfer learning, this is what this is called, like this, is that you can say, well, this dense black box complex CNN, I didn't train it myself. Google trained it using all of their resources. This is a Google standard model. Okay? And SVM, brackets boss, You've seen this before. You understand SVM just fine, right? So in combination of these two, it's got some, like, industry tested, this, this, this. Um, here's a model which works. And, and in, in some ways, that's much better than saying, well, I built this from scratch, and I think it's pretty good. Right? So, um, so this, is, this is the game we're going to play. Um, basically, I'll, I'll pull in some functions. Da, da, da. I've got these separated. So these are cars. I've got these separated into two directories, one of which is called classic cars, and the Arlen calling modern cars. And then I'm going to walk through this directory and then essentially convert this into a, a model image and then get these kind of these th things called logits, which is from this layer. And I'm just going to build a, like a list of all of these. So I'm going to take logits for all these things. So basically, here's, here's my training set. And it's kind of a small training set. I've got 10 images of each of these kind of cars, right? So here's, here's some classic cars like these. <laughs> nice cars. And then here's some modern cars. So these are uh, exotica. Okay. And so that is my training set. Now, now normally, uh, one of these classifiers would require hundreds of thousands of images, right, if you're going to build this um, using from the ground up. But because I've, Google has already built the ImageNet thing using hundreds of millions of images, it's pretty good at images. Now all I need to do is figure out the difference between modern and classic cars. So basically, I can here is I'm taking the outputs which I've kind of stored for all of these, and I'm building just an, an SVM over these these features and targets. So this builds in this is a half second at most, right? So um, I can then go through this and and actually then find out the logit layer for new images which is never seen before and then use the SVM to classify those. So here it, here it says, well, this is a modern one. This one is not a modern car. This is a classic car. Mm -hmm. Modern one, another modern one. It thinks this is classic, which is ridiculous. It's a Prius. Um, another classic one. So, okay. so basically, you can see that we're getting some kind of accuracy, which is surprising, given that it doesn't know about modern classic cars, apart from what it knows about dogs and flowers and other stuff. right? And so what, one of the things here is that it's probably not doing what you think it's doing. In as much as if I'm looking at, if I'm looking at the difference between, this is a kind of a caveat for machine learning in general. Um, if I'm looking at these cars and this, you know, kind of sleek lines and modern cuts and all this kind of thing, whereas this has got kind of bulbous, I, I don't know, did, did, there are different things which I would associate with classic cars versus modern cars. But it may well be that the, what it's interested in is the shape of the wheels. Because the classic cars have ones which are much more like plates, um, which it knows about. And it knows about plates of food. Right? And the modern ones are much more like lotus flowers. Right? So the actual the lotus seed pods. Okay? So the actual things which it's looking out for in these images may have nothing to do with cars at all. Or it may be that the modern cars are always parked on a certain kind of parking lot, whereas the classic cars are in, always in a different kind of context. So you've got to be very careful about what it's looking for when you train these models. 
but I digress. So, so this is basically, so this is just 10, 10, 10 copies of each image, um, produces a model which kind of works, but you have to kind of also know what you're doing. I mean, you, hopefully you can find a blog post which does this, repurpose it, jazz it up to your end, good. So that's, that's kind of the, that's, and this is the kind of thing which we'll talk about at the TensorFlow meetup, um, and more, so. Um, but let's talk about AutoML. So supposing you're not going to get into Keras and do that whole learning curve. So this is for, uh, it's in kind of a new Google thing. They're super proud of it. This is for people that have data, they have money, but don't want to invest in people, sorry, they don't have any specialists. They want AI results, okay? <laughs> because they, they have an AI company and that's what they need. So um, what AutoML will do for you is it will build you a usable model tuned to your data, basically by playing that kind of NASNet game that I described before. They, they essentially use, they, they figure out which of their models will be most applicable to your kind of data and then let it cook, right? Um, and once it's done that fully, auto, fully automatically, you just add money because it can, both train better and serve the model for you straight away. So for, this is a picture for people who are not resources, but more like overhead, i.e. management. So basically, you get your photo data set, you put it through this magic thing, then you get a REST API. And they can also do this for, um, there's some translation stuff, there's some natural language processing stuff, and sh surely these kind of suites of models will come along and get better. So I've got, in the interest of time, I won't do the demo of this. It's pretty much what you see here. So um, basically, there's a data front end where you can drag and drop your folder of stuff into here and give it labels. There's the train interface where you basically, you pick your budget and then you press the train button. Okay. Now your budget includes one hour of free training. But what it will say is it will do its one hour free training and tell you how many more hours it thinks it needs, which you can get a pretty decent model after one hour of free, um, but it may ask for another 23 hours of 20 bucks an hour. So, you know, that's, that's for your boss to decide maybe. Um, and there's also a nice evaluation interface. So basically you can look at the, your prediction accuracy, um, all sorts of metrics, how the training went. And there's also a thing where you can say, well, here's a, it's called a confusion matrix. If I said it was a, a rose or whatever, you know, it, did it make a mistake? What, what other classes is it getting confused by? And having done that, oh, it's way too small, okay. Um, basically, here's some Python code. You can just call this model and it will serve it to you. And, and not just serve it to you, it will give you back the answers. Same with, um, you can, you know, you can do this, you can call it via any REST API. And so it, my guess is this, this is what's well, definitely easy to interface. And because it's Google, it will probably scale. So this model will be usable repeatedly from any device. Um, and it was built fairly painlessly. So if there's time, I'm not sure there's time. I don't want to, I don't want to crush other speakers. So. Um, but this is basically, I, I, all I would be showing you is I have another image and I can just show you that this model really works. We, Sam trained one in New York. We can share the model. I can put an image in. It just works. Um, but there's no time to, sh to give you, show you the hour training process because that's ultimately really boring because all it is is Google doing something in the data center. So the advantages for this is it's kind of easy to use in theory. Um, it, it may not be quite so easy to do the data ingestion because it's really kind of finicky about how it wants it how it wants you to upload these things. You don't need to know anything, you, you hardly need to know anything about machine learning. You need to know about training and test sets and, and what accuracy might mean and all this kind of thing and whether the model is any good. Um, but basically everything's done for you. They training evaluation metrics and you get an API immediately. Um, disadvantages, it's not, it only does classification at the moment. Um, so you will not be able to make you dance, right? So this is, this is the advantage of using Red Dragon AI is that we can make you dance, whereas this will only make classified, not good dancer. Okay. We also get no, no control over what's happening. Um, you can't choose various splits. You can't do the kind of things where um, you might want to have control over this. 
And the results, if, if you've had no control, you may also not understand what's happened. Um, and you can't really poke around because it's kind of, it presents you a finished product. And it's $20 an hour in beta at the moment. Not sure how, whether that goes up or down. Um, clearly, they want people to experiment with this. Um, so conclusions, I guess. So if you need a model but you don't know TensorFlow, this is a fantastic product. And I think what Google has done is they've looked at the number of people on Earth or the number of businesses on Earth and the realistic number of people they can educate and seen that this is a massive gap. So better to ha get this in the hands of people. Just the, the way to democratize it isn't to make it so that everyone can use it. It's to make, or make everyone understand it, but at least they could use it. Um, even if you do know TensorFlow, on the other hand, this is good for a baseline. Um, it, you, know, you can put in your data set to this. It will come back with something. It might, be, it might be really good. On the other hand, it might be a great baseline to show that you can beat Google. So not that I said that. Um, but it probably would, wouldn't win a cattle competition. Okay? If you've got experts building these things, you'll probably be able to build it, beat it, just because the variety of models it will test will not be, and the features it will understand will not be as good as um, in, like specialists who really understand your business. Um, and if you start retraining this just because it's a habit, it might get expensive. So as a wrap up, okay. So the TensorFlow ecosystem is exploding. It's gone kind of way beyond its early stages and now we're kind of, it's probably too much is the problem. So, so there's a, a, an embarrassment of choice right now. Um, on the other hand, where they said, where they started out saying we would get to all these compiled models and all this good stuff, it actually works now. It will actually go onto your, your phone, it's available in the cloud, it will scale, it will do all of these things. Um, and this AutoML is a, allows for a much broader adoption of AI, um, but really it's just machine learning. Um, the AI thing, that's way down the road right now. Um, so the stuff I have, that, the thing which took a while to load is all in a repo on GitHub. If you like it, please add a star. That's my kind of KPI for this. Um, and I'll do a few, a few little ads in the two minutes I'm remaining. So we have this TensorFlow and Deep Learning Singapore meetup. Um, the next one's on the 4th of September. We'll be talking about explainability, where if you've got a, a model, is it doing what you think it's doing? Um, there are a whole variety of techniques, but people are kind of worried that this is um, that's one of the issues with these black box methods, right? Um, all these slides, are, I'm not sure whether there's a, 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 all these slides will be available somehow, I guess. Um, what we try and do is we try and have a talk for the people starting out, talk from the bleeding edge, like papers, and some lightning talks if we can, just anyone who's enthusiastic about what they're doing. Um, I said this before, we've run these deep learning developer courses which a thing called we're calling Jumpstart is module number one. Um, we ran this last year. Um, it was grueling, I think, for the participants, but they got, got a lot out of it, including good jobs, I believe. So, um, in each module, we have kind of instruction, and people have to do projects for themselves. There's SG, Singapore government funding for those people who qualify, which is be citizens and PRs. Um, and we really want that to happen because otherwise we'd be teaching a room full of foreigners. Um, so want that to, that's been actually one of the slow pieces in getting this rolling, just to get all of these approvals through. Um, we're using SG Innovate to help us do that now because they're plugged in far better than someone who looks like me will be. So that's good. Um, in terms of the jumpstart thing, this is a two-day two course. Um, the next one is on the 12th, 13th of September. Um, there, if you go in through SG Innovate down here, for some reason it's under the talent, talent developer, talent development link. Um, this is 600 Sing, um, but there's also, if you can understand it, there's also discounts for, for Singaporeans. So, um, but this is another two-day thing. You get to play with real models from the very beginning. Um, then there's one last thing, is the, the Red Dragon AI, intern hunt. So if, you want the, if you're in a position where it might be interesting to you and you want to do deep learning all day, um, 
we were very interested in people who have an intern period to, to, to cope with. And I, I know because I've done this with uh, several people over the summer. It's worked out super well. They've come out with cool projects, cool resume things. And we get kind of people to plug away at these models, which is kind of still necessary. So um, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you.